The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, with an extended lesson for you in orchestrating a piano score. Back in December, I released an orchestration of Grieg's lyric piece, Talk, as a special thank you to subscribers on the Orchestration Online YouTube channel. Simultaneously, I uploaded a complete analysis of my scoring approach for Patreon supporters. This lesson uses my Patreon evaluation format, talking to the screen in a casual way while I scroll through a score giving feedback and discussing points that might be useful to an orchestrator at any level. I do this for supporters on a monthly basis, looking over their scores and helping them out with various projects they're working on. I've cleaned up the original upload a bit to make it a little more watchable, but aside from that, this represents a lot of what I do over on Patreon. I hope you'll find it helpful in your own scoring. Enough introductions. Here's the original lesson. Um, let's take a look at this piece now to really kind of underline the fact, um, you know, my appreciation to you. I've actually picked a piece where the title is actually thanks, uh, Tak, uh, which is Danish for thanks, uh, by Edvard Grieg, which I've got up on the screen right now. This is just the piano score, which I have included as a line under the full score for your reference. So if you look at the bottom of the screen here on this full score arrangement, you can see Allegretto Simplice, an original piano score not to be performed. There we have it right there. But I have just gone to the dynamic part in Sibelius. We can all take a look at it. here. I'll just uh, get rid of this keypad. We don't need it. Okay, um, so... I will actually insert the video if you have not seen it yet. And it's about three and a half minutes, three and a three quarters minutes long. So have a listen to it now. And I've actually exported the video at 1080 HD. So if you have your YouTube settings for, you know, the highest possible quality, then you should be fine with this. So have a listen to this now, and then we'll come back to it.
Okay, so we're back with talk. All right, so um, let's take a quick look at the score itself. Allegretto Simplice, so a simple, small allegro. Um, and it's, you know, generally speaking, I actually kind of have heard it played on Dante, you know, or maybe a little over on Dante. Uh, it's meant to be kind of reverent and, of course, thankful. It um, sort of starts off as this kind of beautiful chorale idea and has some kind of interesting modulations there uh, because he's wanting to end up in D major down here. You know, he's starting in G and he's ending in D. And that way he can go back to the theme, you know, on a 5-1, simple 5-1 cadence there at the end of bar 12. And then he just does it again. So, you know, he could have easily put a repeat here. Um, but, you know, back then, in the Romantic period, composers like Grieg and uh, Chopin, they would actually avoid putting repeats in their piece because they didn't want um, them to be disregarded uh, back then in the Romantic period. That was another thing that people liked to do, is just cut the repeat. Um, it was kind of a famous thing. I, I think Busoni mentions in his edition of... Um, of the Beethoven sonatas that he always cut the repeat for um, the third movement of the Moonlight Sonata because he just felt that uh, he puts in his own edition that's a chilling tautology. In other words, it sort of made him feel cold inside to have to do the repeat, um, you know, just kind of like it was just being redundant. Um, so, all right, so he, uh, so Grieg forces the performer to repeat this beautiful little chorale bit. Uh, you know, without a repeat that you could cut. And then he goes into this really cool kind of, you know, um, rhythm. Sort of reminds me of, like, maybe even saying Danke schön, Danke schön. I guess, you know, that at that time, um, you know, for the, um, for Northern Central Europe, German would have been just, you know, the, you know, that would have been just a very common language for everybody to use. So I don't know if that's what he intended here with this little three note phrase, but that's what it kind of reminds me. Probably somebody out there who speaks Danish will, will correct me on this. But I, I, I feel that this is meant to, um, meant to evoke just a, just a way of saying thank you or, or the words of saying thank you in some language. So anyhow, it's just something that builds and builds as you probably remember from listening to the uh, to my arrangement of it just a second ago and just gets bigger and bigger and huger and huger until finally the uh, pianist is kind of slamming chords jump jumping from here jumping down there to slam these chords and then ends in a big old roll okay and now here we kind of start off with the same exact uh chorale again and then it jumps up to c major that way he can end up very just a very simple compositional decision it makes this brighter because it's higher and then he ends up in g major from which he can just do the same dankeschön bit uh right here and then of course he does that same exact um chorale with the modulation up to c major again and then he has just a few little uh kind of floaty bits I think this reminded some people of like impressionist composers and it really does kind of seem that way very and the impressionists owed a lot to Grieg um, I think Ravel once said that there wasn't a bar of his that didn't owe something to Edvard Grieg and I think that's very true in terms of like the his wonderful sense of harmony okay so that's just my little walkthrough of this particular um, of this particular piano uh, um, score. So now we're going to look at how I arranged it and why I made the decisions that I did. And Grieg's decisions informed my decisions. Um, I was very um, determined that this particular orchestration would teach you things, you know, it just would be very instructive if you were learning about orchestration and, you know, give you a few ideas of your own as well. So let's take a look at that full score now. Okay, so I started out very simply. Um, I decided that the oboe should carry the melody and not be doubled by any other instrument, just to really give us a beautiful solo. Uh, so the top line of the piano is just 
transcribed directly to oboe, and it's actually in a very nice sweet spot, kind of the middle, the lower middle register. Just a, the D kind of dips down a little bit, but oboists can handle a D or two. That's not a big deal. Uh, but yeah, but just this area right in here is just a just a beautiful, beautiful spot. Uh, in fact, it's the same exact uh, area for the menuet from Le Tombeau de Couperin by Ravel. And, you know, just really look at how it beautifully inhabits the treble staff all the way through. So, pretty easy decision. Uh, now, let's jump down a little bit here and look at the piano score again, which I've uh, inserted at the bottom for you to study. Now, notice it's got this just, you know, the little chorale accompaniment of these other voices. And uh, once again, I decided that I just wanted it to be very simple and sparse to start off with because I'm going to be making it more complex and, and adding more colors later. So the uh, introduction of this idea needs to just be, you know, um, very effective, you know, just really get the point across with as little fuss as possible. And um, you'll also notice that dynamically I've set the accompaniment down a notch from the soloist. And you know, that's just a typical uh, typical strategy. However, I haven't left the entire thing up to the strings, right? So you've got, you've got your um, viola and cello playing this little part here, that kind of the, um, the motion in the bass there in that middle line. So that's all been transcribed directly to, um, to my middle lower strings. And then up here, I've got a first clarinet just playing this particular line. And just before I forget, let me mention right here that I've decided just to have a single oboe. And I start, started off thinking, well, you know, probably two oboes in this. But as I went on, I just really realized I did not need a second oboe. Um, you know, if I've got that bass clarinet in there, that can take over, you know, that can sort of act um, as an accompaniment to the second clarinet and leave the first clarinet free to do things that a second oboe might and also give me a nice kind of uh, cooler sound um, rather than everything being incredibly warm all the time. You know, I just I wanted to get a, a kind of a, a more relaxed sound here and not quite so bright in the middle in my woodwind accompaniment but you will see that as we go. Okay so one last little element to these first four bars is the harp um, playing these little strums here, and that is just a little bit of impulse, you know, just a little bit of of rhythmic punctuation and a little bit of color. But notice how I leave it out here once I go to this pizzicato uh, in the bass, <clears throat> and I just feel that it's just just overdoing it, you know, to add more. And and you probably did not even notice that the harp stopped there, you know. It's just um, you know, it's just a little bit of icing, right? And then here you've got more of the chocolate cake down here. Now, as that pizzicato started to descend, I decided that I would, as you'll notice, it, it's basically just, you know, um, it's following at the octave below. And then here, like Grieg starts to do this offbeat thing, okay? And I have transcribed that directly onto the cello. But I felt at that point, it should be pointed out, right? It should be emphasized uh, rhythmically with the, um, with, you know, following with that pizzicato that I started here a couple bars before. So, yeah, so, so if that is going on, I wanted a little bit of back and forth. And so even though I didn't need to, I added this little pizzicato figure here and doubled that on harp at a slightly higher dynamic. Okay, so it just has a kind of a really clean ping um, I feel that the the sound set that I used here, the note performer, just has slightly too harsh of a pizzicato. Um, it like it's, it assumes that pizzicato at mezzo forte, that the kind of the pluck that you get, which is more forceful, is going to be you know is going to be the response throughout. You know, even if the players are plucking at piano or pianissimo, that it's going to have that same kind of harshness to the to the attack, and it really doesn't. A soft, you know, a pianissimo pizzicato will have almost like a soft, rubbery plunk to it, you know, rather than that kind of ting or tank kind of thing. So, um, yeah. So, anyways, this would work probably very effectively live, 
with note performer, uh, a little too strong, I felt, but that's all right. I wasn't going to overdo it. So our little thing goes on um, all the way through, I felt. And then you've got your sort of second half to the chorale here. Um, and notice that I've done this with the tempo, poco ritardando, and then più ritardando. So like even more ritardando, slowing it down even more. And this is something, if you listen to a pianist play this, you'll notice that they kind of tend to do that. They sort of stretch this out and then they stretch it out a little bit more. And I really feel that this little figure has to be really rhythmically pulled out. Um, and once again, I wonder if um, if this represents almost like a something that people would say to each other, like there's a particular verbal phrase, like something that, you know, what people might say as a greeting um, or as a thank you or some other kind of thing um, that would make have this make much more sense right here. Um, these sort of last three notes. Um, <clears throat> uh, there's a, I think that's called mellow poya, where people would like um, take like a, a spoken phrase and work out the rhythm on, musically, you know, so it, but you know, you could almost speak a poem along to the, um, along to the, the rhythm of, uh, of some music. So anyway, um, so notice I've had the strings come in full, and this is almost a direct string, uh, or in fact, it is a, just a complete string transcription here, except for one little thing, which is I, I feel really kind of proud of. And that is here. So notice this. We've got the melody going G, D, B, G. Okay, and um, par pardon my tuneless singing here. Um, and here it does not do that. Where does it do it? It does it right here in the clarinet, right? Right here, which, I've, which I have... Um, realized as staccato slurs or slurred staccato and here um you know once again i've have i have this solo coming in so you have this the feeling you know the the beautiful blend of clarinet with violin which i feel is just as a very unique once again rather cool sound but here i have allowed the clarinet to pull away from that blended texture and play just these beautiful three notes all by themselves. And I just feel that that's a very effective way of separating a doubling. Okay, so yes, that is um, a technique that I think a lot of you could use in your own scoring. And um, you know, if you haven't thought of that, welcome to it. Okay. Now here, in the middle of this sort of second half of the chorale, I have added just very simple three-part harmony in the horns. In fact, there is a very, there isn't really much of a fourth horn part in this piece, but there is just enough to kind of justify having a fourth horn. And in fact, um, this is something I also intended to talk about. Um, let's take a little break from, you know, that now that we've looked at the first chorale, let's take a look at the, um, at the, back at the instrumentation, which I really should have gone over at the very beginning. Okay, so um, that <laughs> instrumentation, I think it's a, it's a little strange, seems a little strange. I already justified my reasons for uh, only having one oboe, just, you know, just to kind of have a cooler texture. And, and, and also just I didn't feel that you needed more than a single oboe to kind of fill in here and there and to play beautiful solos, um, this kind of a lyrical piece. Two clarinets, two flutes, uh, and they work together pretty well, in, as you'll see later on in the arrangement. Bass clarinet and B-flat. Um, yeah, I just really, I love the bass clarinet, and you'll see that it's extremely useful. Now, I don't overuse it. That's something just I really want to make clear. Do not overuse your bass clarinet, but just use it to fill in and to to complete a texture, to underline things, to double the bass in places. Um, to add some rhythmic punctuation and so on. And I've also scored two contrabassoons, sorry, two bassoons and one contrabassoon. And I feel, you know, I actually avoid scoring contrabassoon a lot of the time because I feel it's a little bit of an overkill. Here, I really just wanted a deep, grinding bass texture um, at the end of the chorale sections in a couple of places. Uh, sorry, excuse me, um, at the ending of the, the second theme in a couple of places. So anyways, 
Um, down here with the brass, you've noticed that I've got like no middle heavy brass, so like no trumpets, no tenor trombones. Um, just four horns in F, uh, bass trombone and tuba. And that is really, you know, for what I have intending, you know, what I'm intending here, and actually a particular kind of color um, that I feel is very Grieg like, you know, something that has a sense of, of real direct seriousness uh, and, and real open intensity, right? You know, he doesn't. Um, Grieg was not the most experienced orchestrator, but when he did really put his mind to it, he was one of, you know, just he had some of the greatest ideas, like um, Pierre Gint Suite, just really beautifully orchestrated, and uh, sections of the piano concerto, just terrifically great romantic orchestration. So um, I'm not saying he's the greatest orchestrator of all time, but I think he had his own unique ideas, and I think they really served him well, and I respect what he did. So um, down here in the percussion, I've just kept it really simple, timpani and chimes, right? And actually the chime part, as you might remember from listening to, the, um, to, the, to my arrangement just now, a pretty simple kind of underlining of the lower notes, but we'll get to that. All right, so now back to the second iteration of the chorale. Okay, so once again, as we discussed at the beginning of this lesson, Grieg just sort of has the the performer repeat the chorale, and he writes it out, you know, completely in his score. And he would have also done that, um, you know, in in pencil. Grieg would always pencil his scores, and then write ink over them once he had all of the notes correct. He felt that he had a uh, he had like a just a perfectly um, perfectly worked out score. So. Here I've taken a different approach here, so I, I want there to be a contrast, right? Everything was on pitch, it was like on at the same pitch as scored in the piano score. Okay, now here, second iteration, jump up the octave. And I take, for the most part, I take this lovely little uh, chorale harmonization up with me and really just make it mostly about the strings. Now, um, on top of that, I have added the the um, flute doubling for the first flute, but notice how I do this little separation here. I go up to kind of a high D pedal, and then allow the um, allow that first flute to just sort of sit there, kind of singing out that high D, while the second flute doubles the first violin. Okay, and then from this point, I start to add little bits of. Uh, of counterpoint and reinforcement and so on that is not in the original uh, piano score. And this is, <clears throat> that's why I feel this is an orchestration. It's more than just an arrangement or a transcription. It is really an orchestration. I have reconceived this idea for orchestra, okay, so that it just really truly feels like it inhabits the orchestra and isn't just a piano piece stuck onto the orchestra. And in fact, I actually use kind of slightly pianistic touches um, here and there that are not in the piano part. Like here, the harp kind of going do 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 pling, pling, and just kind of outlining the harmony for each measure. And, and this would actually not stand out very much. It's just more, once again, it's kind of rhythmic punctuation, kind of the sense of, um, you know, the sense of fi feeling where the downbeat is, which I think is is very important when you've got something as soft, kind of as soft and squishy as, um, you know, violins at uh, mezzo piano. Now back to the flutes. So as you probably noticed, a lot of this kind of counter melody was expressed up here. First flute kind of, you know, playing some, playing some notes kind of suspended and, and also just kind of like, you know, kind of like the upper pedal and so on, just kind of giving a fuller sense to the harmony and more of a sense of, you know, more of a sense of motion inside and just avoiding from repeating, right? Now, here's a touch that I was really happy about was adding the bass clarinet. Now, bass clarinet doubling with pizzicato. Now, notice with this whole thing with the double bass playing pizzicato, I have actually scored, I believe I asked 
Yeah, so pizzicato in in half notes. Okay, and one of the ways you can kind of really make sure that people kind of respect, you know, the double bassist really kind of pays attention to, you know, that very, that kind of longer, longer sustain is to really just actually mark it sostenuto, right? So I just, I've said, you know, I just really want the bass player to make the pizzicato last, you know, just a full two beats and not just let the hall um, which, you know, some of these lower sounds like um, timpani, bass drum, double bass pizzicato, um, lower marimba, and so on. A lot of times when you kind of hit that tone, the hall itself resonates and kind of carries it through. Um, but the, um, the double basses can really just, you know, they can, they can make it feel like a more lived-in note with, uh, with vibrato and just, you know, re really just not letting go of it until two beats have gone by. So that was what I intended there. But <clears throat> if the accent, or sorry, the attack of that note is underlined with a double bass, sorry, with a bass clarinet staccato, then it has just a very nice, um, nice, you know, I've, I've gotten a, a really nice kind of sort of a full attack uh, out of that pizzicato and yet kind of the nicer longer sound and this is actually a really great way to simulate uh, piano attack in your scoring so if you, something just really has to evoke a sense of piano attack try that try longer sustained pizzicato uh, doubled by uh, staccato uh, bass clarinet notes okay all right <clears throat> so yeah so you'll notice here you know once I get to the um, um, kind of the the middle part of the chorale I start to add doubling uh, oboe uh, the two clarinets and um, bassoon uh, which I've, I've left out a few things in this uh, orchestration. I like, for instance, here I didn't mark whether or not this was first or second bassoon. I probably would just just say, you know, bassoon one. Just keep it really simple. Um, so yeah, so this part in here is pretty much doubled, so it gives it a kind of a nice full sound, and that helps this part here, you know, the end of the chorale, those last four bars, to just really feel full in the first half, and then in the second half, I can kind of pull back. Right and have kind of a nicer, softer texture, which I just throw in a tiny little bit of harp. And I want you kind of to think about this, is that, you know, you can use harp just to ice things, just to add filigree, you know, just to add a little bit of pluck to something that is not as obvious as pizzicato, right? And here, you know, notice, just once again, this is also, I feel this is a kind of icing as well, right? You know, you've got this kind of big swell here in the, you know, in the strings all over, but especially it will be felt here on these bass notes, you know, they're going B, E, F sharp. And then, you know, you don't need to do that. You know, you do not need your timpani to change pitches. You just need to have this roll because the B is inherent in the E minor chord, right? So it'll just, you know, the, the ear of the listener, if it really pays attention to this at all, this, um, <clears throat> this timpani roll, um, it will just kind of absorb it into the chord, right? And then, of course, then we finally do go to the pitch. A couple of F sharps. Once again, F sharp is, you know, once again, feels like it is a part of this chord right here, even though, you know, it really isn't. Okay, so then, if then, of course, um, yeah, just pulling back on the doubling to just bassoons, you know, and oboe, doubling that melody, and then, you know, this is almost exactly, I think it's pretty much identical to the, um, you know, to what came before, really, except just slightly different, slightly louder dynamics at the beginning for the fuller texture. Okay, <clears throat> now we get to the Dankeschön part. Um, yeah, so, um, here I have done something slightly unorthodox. Um, I've added just a sort of like a tie or a slur, dashed tie, dashed slur here 
um, because I don't want this to be attacked. That's all it is. I want the player to go, yeah, instead of, uh, duh, you know what I'm saying? So it just, you know, it's just making sure that the, that the attack for this note just comes out of the tremolo. And probably I should have, like, added a, you know, a dashed slur above. So it would really feel like, you know, it would look like a tie more than a slur to the player. <clears throat> and I, I just feel that that kind of gives it a really nice, soft, nice, softer feel at first. And here, notice that I have doubled that with um, flutes and bassoons. Now, the higher tenor register bassoon, when it's played very soft, is a beautiful, um, just just blends beautifully with the flutes. And in fact, um, if you've seen some of my other orchestration videos, you'll know that I comment several times on the way that classical composers used to team up flutes and bassoons in octaves, sort of in this middle area, and that it would, you know, just really had a nice uh, integrated sound. <clears throat> so I take, I make use of that, and I also have the duration of the note uh, being just a dotted quarter note, um, and I feel that that, you know, will have this nice shape. If you've studied the um, my uh, 102 wind section course, you'll know that players attempt to have um, kind of a nice curve to the way that they're, to the way that they articulate notes. Like when they pull out of a note, it'll have a nice kind of round curve at the end. So you don't have to have like a bunch of little um, diminuendo hairpins at the end of each one, right? That's just confusing. The player will know to kind of round off the note. And that rounding off, blends into this and then everything just kind of feels really combined and even in note performer it sounds combined because they've done note performer uh, develop uh, software development guys have done a lot of studying of of waveforms and articulation shapes and so on and so forth okay so <clears throat> so let's so that's really kind of what is going on here with the higher, with the beginning of each note, or the beginning of each bar, you know, the notes at the beginning of the, each bar has that kind of same strategy. And of course I go to octaves here with the violins, and it's just kind of easier. Um, this actually would be pretty simple to do, I think, um, playing non-divisi, but even if they did do it divisi, it would still not really lose any power, I don't think. Um, so, <clears throat> or not lose much. So here, once again, I've got a uh, bass clarinet uh, playing the top note and contrabassoon playing the bottom note to kind of add firmness to this pizzicato. And I've re I've reminded the um, cellist sostenuto. That's actually more important. Um, the uh, sostenuto. It's more important thing for a cellist to read perhaps than a bassist because the bassist will just see you know two beat two beats and they'll just hold it for two beats if they're thinking right. But you know here with the cellist you're just really saying hey, I want a nice firm long note. And of course that becomes easier the harder they pluck the note the longer it's going to last right. And um, you know just firmer and firmer notes until um, finally it's just crashing over here. Okay well what's going on with the rest of the orchestration? You know, we've got the harp doubling, and then past here, um, past bar 20 or 31, it just really doesn't make any sense to add harp. Now, nobody's going to hear it, right? So why make them go through all of that? And you don't really need it, because this, you know, accented pizzicato here is, yeah, just, you know, just doesn't, you know, doesn't really need any help from the harp. Uh, and meanwhile, of course, I've got these chimes going, um, kind of adding kind of a nice clang there. Now notice what happened here with the chimes is that I sort of dropped lower and lower and then finally here um, I had to jump up an octave because there are no B, you know, middle B, middle B flat chimes. And then, um, you know, once we get into the part that really crashes, it's time to bring in the brass. And I thought that they did a very nice, you know, a very nice job of, of just pushing the second half of each bar. Um, you know, even mezzo forte, you know, they still really shine out, just ring out. Now, um, you probably have noticed that throughout this, I've taken a strategy of marking the winds and the brass down a bit and letting the strings uh, play a little bit louder. 
And you probably also noticed that I haven't put in, um, you know, uh, Poco a Poco Crescendo, and I've just added hairpins instead. And that's just, um, you know, I mean, it's just easier to read in one sense, and in another sense, um, it also activates the playback on Sibelius. You know, this is this is something that could, you know, I like to think that that as is with maybe a little bit of editing this could be played successfully by an orchestra with kind of no big deal i mean i, I don't think it's a very difficult uh and a very subtle arrangement but i still think it's just pretty instructive and and works pretty well so so yeah i might make a few changes um and i might have done things to sort of favor sibelius but there it is um now yeah so here we go nice benefit to having bassoon and contra bassoon uh, bass trombone and tuba um, and of course you know all doubling this beautiful deep uh, lower strings part um, and you probably noticed that this really sounded balanced in Sibelius this just this last chord here to this section you know just really kind of and kind of overwhelming of anything else going on you know, I'm marking fortissimo on the harp here and you can't really hear it until it sort of gets above the chord a little bit here but that's okay you know it I mean, a lot of what you hear in harp is just really kind of subconscious. It's okay to do that, just so long as you don't drive the harpist crazy with, with subconscious scoring like this that is too hard to play, right? <clears throat> okay. Now, once again, you know, the timpani can um, cross the gap there um, of playing specific tones or just blending in to the tonality of something. So here we're dipping down a half step to G sharp, and I can just hit that A three times, and nobody will notice, right? Just because your ear, once again, tricks you and just makes it all kind of fit in. All right, so that is how I scored that little bit. Now let's move on to the third iteration of the uh, of the chorale part. Now this is the one that jumps to um, to C major, modulates to C major. All right, so let's see how I did this. So it starts off exactly the same way. Oboes here, uh, first or oboe here, first clarinet supporting, and um, the middle lower strings just you know transcribed perfectly exactly the way they were. Okay, now here I jump up to flute, which kind of adds you know as we jump up in in um you know in our tonal center <clears throat> and in pitch we get it's almost like you know something opens up we it's like the sun coming out from behind a cloud you know suddenly we see a different brighter version of what we were doing before <clears throat> okay now <laughs> this was my favorite part to score here um so here is the actual line you know starting here going to there and then from here i had first clarinet take over the actual melody right which um you know is pretty much at the pitch though of the original piano score right it goes all the way up there to just a above the staff um uh there and then um then here i just jump up to a you know kind of like a counter melody above which i i felt you know since the clarinet in the clarino register is going to carry in a nice pungent way the um the flute up there in its middle register is is you know it, it will compete a little bit but not too much you know not tragically so not really blotting out the original idea and of course you've heard this you know you, you're going to the the part of the memory of the audience is going to play into it as well and you know and if even if even if that weren't enough there would still be enough support below um to just you know to help the harmony of it to support the original idea of the melody. All right, so here we get into <clears throat> this particular thing, and once again, um, I've used a couple of different strategies here. One is I've kept everything very high, you know, an octave higher than originally scored, and I've gone to just straight uh, four-part harmony in the winds, and I just I think that's a really effective way to just introduce um you know completely unique texture um kind of unblended with uh, with strings i feel it gives it just a lot of 
intimacy. You know, the suddenly the listener is sort of brought to this other place that is small, but it forces them to really listen because it's a unique place. It's a unique timbral sound. And then, of course, I relieve that sense of uniqueness with um, <clears throat> with everybody being doubled in a nice firm way by the strings. But once again, I, I played that little trick, which is to stop on the note here, in this case, the C natural, and then have the melody instrument, which is doubling right here, the, um, you know, our, in this case, um, the, uh, the first flute is going to just continue on with this lovely little three note figure here, and then come back together. All right. So that was that was a way to bring some freshness to this same chorale idea. All right, so here we are in the second iteration of that Dankeschön part. Now, I, you know, I just really want to bring variety just because I, as an orchestrator, like to, you know, I just like to play with ideas. I like to think of how many different ways you could do something. And that is a very useful um, strategy to take with you into um, into scoring an arrangement like this, right? So you can you can borrow some things, um, like for instance, I keep going with a with a sense of being doubled. This time, you know, it's kind of like bassoons. I probably should have put out a tenor clef there. Bassoons, oboes, second flute, but the first flute now is doubling the first violin. Now notice the difference here in scoring. So pianissimo, um, I've got tenuto, tenuto slur, right? So it's just going to be a very full but very soft note. Okay, and I feel that that'll give some support here to this tremolo uh, without, you know, without taking over the tone. Now, of course, probably the most obvious difference is the sense of <clears throat> these, these octave uh, these kind of jumping octaves back and forth, right? So D, this is also D, that would be um, middle D and then D below um, in concert pitch. And that gets caught by this D down here by contrabassoon an octave lower, right? Which doubles this double bass note down here. Okay, the viola is really kind of playing all the pitches in that kind of that octave jump back and forth which is kind of fun um, and then here violin the second violin and cello are kind of teaming up to play tremolo throughout all right first I thought oh we'll just have all of these people play tremolo but then I thought about it just like that is really overkill and there's no sense of punctuation here so I decided to have the viola play pizzicato instead and be doubled by the harp Right? And here's a case where harp just really adds a lot. Um, you know, it doesn't dominate, but it, it, you know, it doubles in such a way that the pizzicato isn't so harsh. You know, it just has more, um, it has more sustain to it, has more juice to it. And then, you know, the chimes are exactly the same. And, you know, and th this part in here, very, very similar, um, you know, if, if not identical in a lot of ways. But I did like this part in here where I start to do um, a, like Divisi on the tremolo. I thought that was really fun. It just you know really made me happy to score. And I made the harp part go up an octave um, just to kind of give once again a little sense of, of variety there. All right, so last iteration of the chorale part. Okay, so. <clears throat> So I decided, look, you know, this is Grieg. So let's um, let's use some of Grieg's strategies. And this is something Grieg liked to do a lot. He liked to have um, like uh, scoring where the there was like an offbeat, just playing, you know, playing on all of the beats and a beat and a half sections. So uh, if there's a there's a piece called Gade, which you should check out, which he also does this, uh, which was um, dedicated to his friend Niels Gade. Um, another great uh, composer uh, from Scandinavia. So I've just borrowed a little bit of that idea here. Um, you know, using, like for instance here, um, I have the cello come in half a beat late, but then play the last two notes, right? With the second note 
of this little couplet, you know, in line with the sense of of these sort of separated tenudos, right? Okay, <clears throat> and this part really did remind me of the Gada piece, and I put that in here. Now, this may seem very pianistic, but actually, once the harpist gets their hand situated right here, it's very, very simple because they all they have to do is just make little changes and very slowly descend. And this covers a ninth or a tenth, and that's a very comfortable stretch for a harpist. So it should be pretty easy to climb down you know, gradually through these steps and then play, you know, once again, a very harpistic part here. So that's not a big deal, really. Um, what I'm more interested in this section is um, the fact that I have added the horn coming in. You know, this time, instead of jumping up an octave, like the flute did in the previous section where we changed to C major, here I'm having the horn um, go down, um, you know, so, so it's actually... <clears throat> uh, an octave lower than the arrangement and you know and just like the piano score just trots along there's like nothing different really about it in all of the other places except it's just transposed right but I managed to kind of pull this this bigger and bigger arrangement out of it um, and I'm particularly happy with this line here in the um, in the violins which is just a sort of a transformation of the harmony that's happening right here, right? So that it's more just, you know, just more intense part writing than Grieg possibly intended, but you know, maybe a direction he might have gone in had he decided to orchestrate. He, Grieg tended to transcribe more when he orchestrated rather than transform. Um, now, uh, but speaking of Grieg, uh, Grieg touches like right here, I kind of went out on a limb here. This is not in the piano part at all, right? It just does the same thing again. But I added this, um, this kind of like backwards major seventh chord. Um, and just because it's a little bit of a quote from his piano concerto, I just felt, you know, that would be kind of cool. And that would be sort of me thanking Grieg for writing that piano concerto, which was very inspiring to me and to a lot of my piano students when I was teaching piano. Okay, so here we are um, near the end of this near the end of the score and sort of the end of this little lesson. Um, <clears throat> let's enlarge this a bit. Okay. So I've kind of gone back to the first idea of the Dankeschön part, just having you know very simple background um, doubling to these. Um, to these tremolo strings. Once again, I've gone back to the kind of uh, the dashed, the little um, the little dashed slur here, just kind of carrying forward the tremolo without really articulating a uh, a firm uh, a firm second note. Um, then pizzicato, um, kind of borrowing from the second version of this that I did. Um, little and notice no tremolo, kind of jumping back and forth as before and um, and just and having the second uh, second clarinet and then bass clarinet doubling the the pizzicato just you know I feel that, that just really gives a nice sense of life to all of that um, and then we get to here and I could have done a lot of things I could have had strings doubling this um, you know this kind of last little bit of chorale here but instead, I just had the horns just suddenly take it over. And you'll see, you know, if you listen to the orchestration again, it actually dovetails in really, really well, even though I didn't have any actual dovetailing pitches. Just the sense of momentum leading right into the horns is enough to carry it through. So you don't have to, you know, and sometimes when you're transitioning between different timbres and different textures, you don't have to really do the actual overlap right on the pitch, just so long as the sense of momentum, the sense of carrying things through, is strong enough okay so but I just felt it was really nice almost like a surprising sense of power there you know just like the it's almost like I wanted to I wanted to capture Grieg saying yay I really am thankful <laughs> right he's just this piece says this piece is thanks right and and you know and of course I am really really thankful to you guys for keeping this going and you know just really 
helping transform the vision of what education could be on the internet, you know. Um, and a little bit of um, warmth in here by the by the timpani, not too much, right? Just up to mezzo forte, uh, and then dub, then kind of same dynamics dying down. Um, and I actually added this one note here, <laughs> uh, concert E flat, which is you know doesn't really violate the. It's, it sounds a little strange, but I just felt that it needed this motion, the sense of motion going through here. If you look at the original uh, piano part, there's no E flat down there. So anyway, I just felt it worked a whole lot better. Um, so now we've got our final, you know, our final two chords. And here I did kind of a very soft lower tutti. Um, you know, I've got the, uh, um, the oboe playing this G and then I've got the lower winds playing, you know, kind of doubling the brass to a degree um, <clears throat> and the strings providing a cushion to all of that. Um, it's, it's kind of nice. One of the things about tremolo is that with tremolo you have just, you know, dozens of little individual um, attacks, right? Played without any kind of rhythmic value, usually. And so it's very easy to swell on that chord, um, you know, in a different way than you would just by pushing into the bow, right? Then finally, it ends with a, you know, just a nice long, um, nice long fermata, you know, and over that fermata, I have the, uh, the harp just playing this very slow uh, arpeggio ending with a nice G third at the top, which is doubled by the flutes. So anyways, um, I think company has just arrived. It is the day after Christmas here in New Zealand, and so I have to uh, stop teaching you now. But I really want to thank you guys for, um, you know, once again, for making 2016 a very cool year for me, you know, despite, you know, I think we all had some challenges this year, and I will have another general message for the group uh, in, in the new year. Thanks very much.